My name is Shankar Ramaswamy, and I'm the Chief Business Officer of Axivant Gene Therapies. We're a clinical stage company focused on developing a pipeline of novel gene therapies for neurological disorders. And today I'll provide an overview of our company's vision and pipeline of gene therapies. Axivant's clinical stage gene therapies include AAV and lentiviral vectors for pediatric and adult neurological disorders. We believe that gene therapy can have a role in the treatment of a broad range of CNS diseases, including rare and ultra-rare conditions driven by single monogenetic defects, but also some of the most prevalent non-genetic diseases where the underlying neurobiology is well understood. Our pipeline of gene therapies for rare pediatric disorders includes AXO-AAV GM1 and AXO-AAV GM2, gene therapies for the treatment of GM1 and GM2 gangliosidosis, which is also known as Tay-Sachs disease. These are rare and fatal monogenetic pediatric lysosomal storage disorders for which there are currently no approved therapies. As I will talk about later in this presentation, AXO, AAV, GM1, and GM2 have been evaluated in multiple small and naturally occurring large animal models of disease, where robust and durable improvements in enzyme activity, clinical function, and survival have been observed. The first child was dosed in the Tay-Sachs disease program in late 2018, and we reported three-month data last month. The first child with GM1 gangliosidosis is expected to be dosed with axo aav gm one this quarter. We're also developing a lentiviral gene therapy for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. This therapy is designed to deliver all three of the genes required for the endogenous synthesis of dopamine from tyrosine, uniquely enabled by the larger packaging capacity that a lentiviral vector offers. 17 patients have been dosed to date, including 15 patients with our predecessor construct, known as ProSavin, and two patients with our next generation construct, known as Axolenti PD. ProSavin has shown a durable effect in Parkinson's disease patients with sustained efficacy out to six years in a prior published phase one, two study. We recently reported three month data from the first cohort of the Sunrise PD phase two study of Axolenti PD in which a 25 point improvement in the UPDRS part three off levodopa score was observed. To give additional detail on Axolenti PD, this is a lentiviral gene therapy that delivers all three of the critical enzymes and cofactors required for the endogenous synthesis of dopamine directly from tyrosine, a ubiquitous amino acid. The therapy is administered by a one-time stereotactic injection into the putamen, thereby delivering a tonic, steady level of dopamine directly to the relevant site of action. By providing not only AADC to convert levodopa into dopamine, but also tyrosine hydroxylase and cyclohydrolase 1 to produce levodopa itself, Axolenti PD aims to improve motor function while patients are off levodopa, while also reducing fluctuations that cause dyskinesia. Now, ProSavin was the predecessor construct of Axolenti PD, in which the same three genes were being delivered within the same lentiviral vector approach, though the ordering of the transgenes was different, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. In a prior published phase one, two study, ProSavin was able to achieve a meaningful improvement in motor function on the UPDRS part three scale assessed while patients were washed off of levodopa therapy with a durable improvement of approximately eight points observed out to six years. Note that patients with advanced Parkinson's disease would typically be expected to experience an increase or worsening of about three to four points per year on this scale or approximately 18 to 24 points over six years. This slide shows videos of Parkinson's disease patient, uh, of one particular Parkinson's disease patient at baseline, and the very same patient six months after receiving ProSavin. Note that these assessments and videos are being done while the patient has been washed off of oral levodopa medication. At baseline, the patient on the left displays classic features of advanced Parkinson's disease. That includes bradykinesia, rigidity, and tremor. After receiving ProSavin, as you can see on the right side, 
this very same patient is able to stand and walk relatively normally. While the efficacy of ProSavin was encouraging, a more potent construct was simultaneously generated through a series of combinatorial experiments. The most potent version has now been advanced forward into clinical development as Axel NTPD. This re-engineered construct is designed to achieve a greater efficiency and potency of dopamine production through a reordering of the CH1, TH, and AADC transgenes, essentially moving CH1 closer to the promoter to drive greater efficiency of levodopa expression and conversion by AADC to dopamine. This greater potency and efficiency of catecholamine production was verified in a primary human cortical neuron model in which up to tenfold greater potency was observed with Axel NTPD compared to ProSavin. We have advanced Axel NTPD into the currently ongoing phase two Sunrise PD study. This study includes a dose escalation phase, and once we have identified an optimal dose, a sham controlled phase. We recently reported data from cohort one of this study, which evaluated a dose of 4.2 E6 transducing units and we plan to dose the first patient in cohort two this quarter, which will evaluate a dose of approximately 1.4 E7 transducing units. Now, regarding the safety, consistent with the prior experience with ProSavin, Axel NTPD was observed to be generally well tolerated with no serious adverse events reported in this first cohort of the Sunrise PD study. There were no complications of surgery on post-procedure MRI. And moving on to the efficacy, to give you some background, the UPDRS Part 3 motor scale is the gold standard assessment of motor function in Parkinson's disease. The scale is assessed by a physician, and the off score is measured after patients have been washed off of oral levodopa therapy for at least 12 hours in a clinic setting. This enables the measurement of motor function without the confounding effect of oral levodopa allowing an assessment of the true effect of the therapy. A substantially larger improvement of 25 points was observed at month three with Axel NTPD, as compared to the previously conducted ProSavin study, where a 7.3 to 10.8 point benefit was observed at month three. For reference, this slide also shows the benefits reported in the sham study arms of two previously conducted sham controlled Parkinson's disease gene therapy studies. 3.8 to 5.3 points at month three. Moving on to the efficacy on other scales as well, a consistent and clinically meaningful benefit was also observed on the UPDRS activities of daily living subscale, which captures how well a patient can do tasks of daily living, such as clothing, bathing, and feeding oneself. In addition, a benefit was also observed on the UPDRS complications of therapy subscale. Again, these benefits were larger in the first cohort of Axel NTPD than those observed in the earlier Pro7 study. Taken together, these results provide further clinical validation of the greater potency of Axel NTPD compared to Pro7. So based on these promising results, we have decided to proceed to the second dose cohort of the Sunrise PD study, which will test a half log dose escalation compared to the first cohort. The first patient in this second cohort will be dosed this quarter. Now moving on to our GM1 and GM2 programs. GM1 and GM2 ganglicidosis, which is also known as Tay-Sachs disease, are devastating fatal pediatric lysosomal storage disorders that are characterized by rapid decline with the life expectancy of only two to four years in the severe forms of the diseases. There are currently no approved treatments and limited effective treatment options for these patients. AXO-AV GM1 and AXO-AV GM2 were developed over the past decade at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, a leader in the development and discovery of genetic medicines. The biology of GM1 and GM2 ganglicidosis is well understood. In the case of GM1 ganglicidosis, a mutation in the GLB1 gene leads to impaired production of the beta-galactosidase enzyme, resulting in the accumulation of GM1 ganglicides. In the case of GM2 ganglicidosis, 
a mutation in the hex A or, or hex B gene leads to impaired production of the beta hex A enzyme, resulting in the accumulation of GM2 ganglicides. Given the monogenetic nature of both disorders, these are ideal targets for gene therapy. Moreover, gene therapy can leverage a cross-corrective mechanism to improve enzyme activity, where transduced cells function as factories for the production of a secreted enzyme, which can then be endocytosed by surrounding cells with the accumulated pathology. A unique feature of these diseases is that enzyme activity levels are known to closely correlate with disease severity. In infantile Tay-Sachs disease, children have approximately 0.1% or less of normal hex A enzyme activity and have a very severe disease course, with the disease onset within a few months of life and survival of only three to four years. By contrast, in juvenile Tay-Sachs disease, patients have approximately 0.5% of normal hex A enzyme activity and have a much later age of onset and survival into the teenage years. Therefore, restoration of hex A enzyme activity levels to even 0.5% of normal could represent clinically meaningful effects for these patients. A colony of naturally occurring cats with GM1 ganglicidosis has been developed and maintained at Auburn University for several years. And in this naturally occurring large animal model, GLB-1 gene therapy was shown to significantly improve neuromuscular function and survival compared to untreated cats who reached their humane endpoint within about eight months. This also translated into preserved brain architecture and myelination on MRI, as can be seen on the right side of the slide. Similarly, in a mouse model of GM2 ganglicidosis, gene therapy was shown to increase hex A enzyme activity levels in a dose-dependent manner and also reduce the accumulation of GM2 ganglicides, the toxic pathology in this disease. This also translated into a dose-dependent improvement in survival with restoration of survival to wild-type levels at the highest dose. We recently reported three-month data from a 30-month-old child with severe infantile Tay-Sachs disease who received axo aav gm 2 This was a child with advanced disease, as can be seen by their disease course on the left, having exhibited structural abnormalities on imaging, and this child was experiencing recurrent seizures as well as actually requiring a G2. Due to the severe pathology that was evident in this child's brain, the child actually did not receive an intrathalamic injection, but rather received only an injection into the cisterna magna and lumbar spinal canal. Note that the intended route of administration for axo aav 2 is co-administration of vector into the thalamus as well as CSF to achieve broad cortical distribution as well as spread throughout the neuraxis. To summarize the clinical findings, axo aav 2 was observed to be generally well tolerated with no serious adverse events to date. Importantly, the clinical condition of this advanced Tay-Sachs disease patient was observed to be stable from baseline to month three, as was structural architecture of the brain as evidenced by MRI. This is noteworthy considering the advanced stage of this patient's disease and the limited life expectancy and rapid rate of decline of children with infantile Tay-Sachs disease. Now, moving on to the biomarkers, a greater than threefold improvement in CSF hex A enzyme activity was observed at three months after CSF injection of axo aav 2 to a level of 1.44% of normal at month three. Increases in serum hex A enzyme activity were also observed at five different measured time points, likely due to diffusion of the enzyme produced in the CSF where the vector was actually injected back into the serum. Of note, a 25% reduction in CSF GM2 ganglioside levels was also observed from baseline to month three, further corroborating the improvement in hex A enzyme activity levels in the CSF following administration of axo aav gm 2 As I mentioned earlier, our vision at Axivant is to build and rapidly advance a leading pipeline of late-stage gene therapies for the treatment of rare as well as prevalent neurological diseases. 2019 has been and will continue to be a rich year for us with multiple clinical milestones and data readouts expected across our programs. 
We look forward to updating the field as we make progress over the course of 2019 and beyond. Thank you.